welcome back to Rome. We're in the Piazza Minerva, just southeast of the Pantheon. And in fact, you can see it right here. So super close. And you've got no good reason not to check this place out too, by the way. In fact, people trying to find the Pantheon en route from Piazza Venezia or off the traffic artery that is Via del Corso often don't realize where they are or what they're seeing when they bumble through here almost accidentally. So I'm going to tell you, then you'll never be one of them. Now, if you've never heard of this place or don't recognize it, don't strain yourself trying. No famous movies filmed here or scenes from books, at least none that this nerd can personally recall, and no great shock really. If you look around, it's a fairly simple, unassuming square, no loud, gaudy church facade, though there is a very fine boutique for those most discerning endeavor of fashionistos of the holy orders. The centerpiece is all to really draw the eye, and as it should, since it was done by John Lorenzo Bernini. Now, if you don't know who that is, exit this video. Go pick up a book. I'm serious. Go. You owe it to yourself, and you'll thank me later, I promise. By the way, why are you living under the rock? Is it rent controlled? Can you get a Wi-Fi set up, or do you need a landline? Anyways, suffice to say, he should have had, like, three Ninja Turtles named after him. At least. Though, thematically speaking, I never felt that Donnie really qualified fairly. I guess it was probably an easier fit than Bernie. It sounds like a middle-aged amateur bowler, not a teenage anything really. John Lorenzo Bernini's kind of my favorite artist. Ever. Period. Ever. <clears throat> uh, over the past decade or two, he's gotten more attention than just from fellow geeks of art, academics, and historians, though. His work was a central plot focus in Angels and Demons, part of Dan Brown's Robert Langdon saga. The increased interest has also increased traffic to get to see his work, and some have responded by closing them off even more from the public, rather tragically. But this example requires no admission fee, and no dress code, thankfully. It's not his greatest work in scale or complexity and often gets shrugged off because of it, but it actually has a more interesting story behind it than this simple piazza and rather straightforward design would have you believe. Pope Alexander VII commissioned the monument in 1667, tending to have it erected over the former Temple of Isis. Rome has 12 famous obelisks, nearly all of which were pillaged from Egypt during the Roman Empirical Age, this one included. So if you ever felt confused as to why there were hieroglyphs on Roman ruins, that's probably why. Most monuments bear symbols and images referencing the name or family that commissioned it in ways completely opposite of subtle. But the elephant didn't represent any Roman family. Not literally, anyways. The inscriptions in Latin on the base translate as follows, <clears throat> approximately. These symbols of the science of Egypt which you see engraved upon the obelisk borne by the elephant, the most powerful of all animals, take them as the precept that a strong mind is needed to support a solid knowledge. For the ancient Egyptians, the obelisk was a representation of the divine rays of the sun, and the elephant was a symbol for the earth. They would draw water up in their trunk, which, along with the sun, would nourish and fertilize grains, allowing for new life to grow after being reborn. Yes, reborn through their excrement. In the text that Alexander VII gave to Bernini that inspired the work, the reader actually enters inside the elephant, wherein is found a man and a woman. And I bet you can guess how the rest of this metaphor gets spelled out now, huh? Alexander VII's papal crest on the side might further reveal why such an allegory may have been especially appealing. Formerly Fabio Chigi, his family symbols include eight pointed stars above a cluster of six hills or mountains, as well as trees. Stars, a symbol for the heavens and the realm of God, light even in darkness, shining down onto masses of earth. And trees, a symbol of wisdom and knowledge that grows up out of the ground. Even the elephant's dress hammers home the taking in divine knowledge to sow wisdom from within symbolism. The Egyptians believed in the resurrection of the body, a mythology that was passed on then to the Jews. Anyone reminded Jonah and the whale? Where it then, of course, passed on down to the Christian faiths. So, following all of this symbolism, mythology, imagery, and poop metaphors, 
obelisk means divine light, means God, shines down onto the earth, herein played by an elephant, but can also mean a person, draws up water, which I guess can mean a kind of earthly knowledge, I guess, in its trunk to combine to create nourishment for the next generation of life, or I guess the soul after the resurrection of the body in the last judgment. Which, honestly, after all the dizzying loop-de-loops of this whole thing, my mind always gets a little distracted and derails for a few moments just to laugh at everyone will come back from the rapture as elephant dung. And my ADHD means sometimes I can happily leave it there and not- Oh, hey, look, a penny! 